Liz and I love music. We love music. We love to dance. Um, you know, we we go see a lot of live music. And you know, when the when the pandemic and the world was shut down, that was one thing that man we missed so much was being able to go see music. I come from a long line of musicians. Um, my mom and dad were both opera singers, and my mom was a, a music professor at a small university in Oklahoma for a long time. I grew up playing the violin. I played the guitar. You have 18 girls on your team who were coached 18 different ways, learned skills 18 different ways. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, how do you do this? Welcome to another episode of Heated Conversations. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of season two. I'm super excited that we have head coach of University of California, Berkeley, Justin Howell on the podcast. He just finished with his team competing in the Super 16 in Las Vegas. And off camera, we kind of talked about how their team did. He's very proud of how the, his team did. And this weekend, they have another podium training, not training, sorry, competition in Utah. Super excited for him to kind of talk about what 2024 season holds for them there and also kind of discuss a little bit about himself, some history on him. So let's welcome Justin to the podcast. Justin. And welcome. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be on here. And uh, just before we get started, I'll mention that I'm the co-head coach, uh, along with my wife, uh, Liz Crandall Howell. Uh, so I got to make sure I get that right. No, I think that's perfect. It's it's always good to do that, especially to honor the position, but obviously to honor your wife. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that you were asking me about the beginning of the season. Is that correct? Yeah, I had kind of mentioned to the viewers and listeners as we kind of intro that you had just finished competing at the Super 16 in Las Vegas, as well as you're going to compete in Utah this weekend for another podium competition. And so you want, can you talk about how this weekend went for you and your team and kind of what you are excited about leading into this coming weekend's competition? Yeah, absolutely. We had a great start at the Super 16, at the Mean Girls Super 16 Challenge in Las Vegas. Um, it, it's such a great way to start the season because it really does replicate the national championships. Format's the same. It's on podium. We have podium training. Um, and there were 15 other amazing teams there that we got to compete against really right out of the gate. So I think it sets the tone for for the season and, and what we you know hope to be competing um, in that similar format at the end of the season. Um, it was a great way to start. You know, our, our team had a tremendous preseason. They really, really put in the work and, and they they uh, looked great and had a lot of confidence um, going into this competition. And uh, we we started off on bars just right out of the gate, really, really strong. And we headed over to beam, I think, with a lot of energy. And we got a little bit tight when we got to beam. And I think it was a great learning opportunity of how to manage those emotional highs and lows um, as we continue to go through the season. Um, so beam was a little bit tight for us, but we brought it back on on floor and vault. Um, and I, I was just really, really excited with, you know, we didn't count a fall for the first meet of the season. So that was awesome. Um, but we also had a lot of new faces and routines in the lineup. Um, and, you know, we're really trying to test our depth early in the season and give some people some opportunities. And, um, you know, we had the opportunity to have some exhibition routines um, in this competition. And so we got to test some of those athletes out and we finished on vault, um, which is an event that we've really been working hard on uh, improving, 
you know, just bigger vaults, better landings, and adding some tenor start values. Um, and the very, very last vault was an exhibition, Jaden Silvers, who's a sophomore who actually came in early last year in December. So she graduated early uh, from high school and came in. And she's just learned a Yurchenko one and a half. And she was in the exhibition spot, first time ever doing it out on the hard. And she stuck it cold and uh, I think got a 995 on that vault. And it was just, our, our team was so thrilled for her um, as well as the coaching staff. And so it was moments like that in this first competition that really, really stood out to me and give us a lot of confidence um, moving forward in the season, knowing the kind of depth um, and athletes that we have on our team. Yeah. And kind of going alongside, you know, the competition, especially on vault, is it ever kind of nerve wracking sometimes to compete some of these first, uh, especially early on some of these 10 vaults, like one and a half. And even talking about someone who just recently learned it and to compete it, um, or is it something that, you know, strate strategically, depending on the athlete, you want to put in either mid season or later on, or just kind of see where it's at early on and then kind of compete something that's like, a little more consistent or clean or uh, throughout the season until, you know, you train it a little bit more and then you're able to really put it out to kind of make that run towards a national championship. Yeah. I think testing it early um, is definitely the way to go. And, um, you know, right now's the time to do it as we get further into the season uh, and closer to the postseason. It, it's not necessarily the time to be testing a lot of new skills. So now is the time um, not nerve wracking in, in the sense of, you know, whether we think that they're going to make it or not. Um, I think that there's the, the nervous excitement of doing something for the first time. Um, but, you know, our athletes put a lot of time and, and energy in the gym at, at learning these skills, doing them safely, doing them the right way. And so as a coaching staff, we're really confident with the choices that we make when we go out to compete. Um, but, you know, I mean, Vault is always a, an event that relies heavily on adrenaline as well. And so finishing the meet off on vault, um, especially when you've had, you know, maybe not your best rotation and some tight scoring on the, the event before, and then you're finishing on that event where you really have to, you know, bring the energy back up, that can be difficult. And so I was really, really happy with the way that our team responded on that last event, um, you know, all the way through the lineup. I mean, we had some spectacular vaults, some spectacular sticks, um, and we have several more 10 start values in our, our arsenal um, that we'll be testing out and, and putting in the lineups over the next few competitions. And, uh, you know, typically on, on bars, I know Cal usually has pretty good bars. Um, can you kind of talk about some of those new um, skills or even just routines that were showcased this past weekend? Yeah, I mean, we were really, really fortunate that we um, didn't lose a lot of routines heading into this season. So um, we have a lot of returners and a lot of returning routines with um, experience, which is great. Um, we did have Mickey Adorento in the exhibition spot, and uh, she went out, drilled a beautiful routine. And so, again, it was really nice to see, okay, you know, when we need to call on Mickey to um, – you know, be in that top six, she's ready in there. And it's going to be a really, really good counting score. Um, so not a lot of new faces in the bar lineup right now. We do have, you know, number seven, eight, nine, and 10 that are all ready to go. And, and they're all interchangeable bar routines with some great difficulty. And we have Jordan Kane, who's ready to go. We have Casey Brown, who I'm really excited for people to see. Um, she, um, you know, potentially is going to get some lineup opportunities pretty soon. Um, she has a, just, you know, think back to my days as a gymnast where we had uh, virtuosity as, as part of the uh, execution score. And um, Casey absolutely has virtuosity in her gymnastics, beautiful long lines. Um, she does a uh, toe front pike half that is a hundred feet in the air and incredibly exciting. So I can't wait for people to get to see her um, I think she's really going to make an impact and and she's um, looking really, really strong in practice. And, you know, kind of staying on this track of just the competition, how does the team within themselves be able to have so much depth on events, but yet be able to be super supportive and even as a coaching staff to strategically plan to put people in, you know, sometimes you'll have competitions where you might compete on a Friday and then compete on a Sunday or, you know, 
within a three day span, you're competing twice, you know, being able to really uh, make sure that one, you're keeping your athletes as healthy as possible and keeping them as fresh as possible because you know what you have instead of say an all arounder competing all around all the time and someone could come and relieve her. So once, you know, postseason comes, she has the best opportunity to make a run for individual championships um, when that time comes. Yeah. I mean, the, the strategy of lineups is, is always challenging and um, you know, Cal has a history of, of pulling from a lot of all arounders and, you know, I, I hear people talk about it on, on social media all the time. And it's not always by design that we're specifically choosing all arounders to compete. Um, those individuals just happen to be in the top six each time and are prepared. But we do a lot of little mini inner squads. Um, we do things called blue light specials in the gym where we randomly call out a person that has to salute and show, show a routine, even if they haven't warmed up and they're not prepared. And I think that those little things get people prepared to compete at any moment um, so that when we need to make lineup changes or, or add somebody new in as a coaching staff, we have the confidence. Um, we have the data points on them in the gym because we've seen them in those pressure situations. Um, I think our team is very, very supportive of, of each other and they, they genuinely want each other to have competitive opportunities. So when we put somebody new in the lineup, our team is very supportive of that decision and they're incredibly excited for that individual to get those opportunities. And they know at the end of the day that the coaching staff is making the best decision for the team. And the team has the goal of, you know, being the best that they can possibly be. And so it makes it really, really easy, you know, to be supportive of those decisions. Um, but the preparation happens in the gym and we give them as many opportunities to compete in practice as possible so that we can put the best lineup out on the floor. And kind of staying on the topic of gymnastics, and we'll kind of do this a little backwards. Where I usually I ask these two intro questions, but I'll kind of ask them later as we kind of talk about you, um, because I like kind of where we're going with the gymnastics piece. Mm -hmm. And so, what to like when you guys are re recruiting, or not necessarily recruiting, when you guys think about how many athletes that you guys have, what's a good number that you guys like to kind of stay around that you feel like gives you the opportunity to have good depth? but also a good manageable size team? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and we've had, you know, over the years, we've had different roster sizes um, that we've managed. Um, you know, we've had as many as 21 on the team, which honestly is pretty big. Um, and we've had as little as 14. We currently have 15 on the roster. Um, I think next year we move up somewhere around 16. And, and I think between 16 and 18 is a pretty you know, happy place to be as far as roster management goes. Um, we have really enjoyed having a smaller team over the last couple of years. It really gives the coaching staff the opportunity to get to know each person, you know, as an individual, as a human being outside of, of being an athlete. Um, sometimes when you have a larger team, it's just hard to get to know every single person deeply. And so I've really enjoyed the really strong relationships and bond that I have with every single person on our team. And I think that some of that is we have um, less people right now. So it's a little bit easier to do. And I know that our team feels similarly that, you know, as a group, they do a lot of things together. They're, they're always with each other. They hang out with each other in some way, shape or form. They all live with each other. Um, and so having a little bit of a smaller roster gives them the opportunity to get to know each other deeply as well. Um, so I think between that that 15 and 18 number is a good place to be. And, and that's where I imagine that we'll stay um, in the foreseeable future. And what do you see as the reasons why the athletes that choose to commit and compete for Cal are the reasons that they decide to go there? Is it because of these relationship aspects where you kind of talk about or even just the opportunities to compete? at a high level on certain events or just the experience that your staff has, what are some typically when you kind of are going through that process with recruits and eventually have commits kind of what is their reason that they share that they made the decision to go to Cal? Yeah, that's a great question. Being challenged, I think is a huge one. Um, you know, Cal is the number one public university in the world. Academically, you're going to be challenged. Um, 
and you're certainly going to be challenged athletically. And everybody on our team is of that mindset. They're all excellent students. They all have big plans for themselves outside of doing gymnastics and, and, and are focused on graduating and what that next step is going to be. The resources that we have at the university, um, in our Cameron Institute and within the athletic department to prepare them for, for life after sport um, are second to none. And so I, I think that they get a real sense of what the, the, the overarching mission is, is to come to college and graduate and get a phenomenal education and have the tools to go out and be a successful adult in the world in whatever you know field of, of study that you choose. And I think that they really get a sense that, that Cal can provide that for them when they're visiting and learning about the university. Um, I think that our staff also is a big part of it. Um, you know, we have myself and Liz, my wife, the co-head coach, uh, John Carney, and now Nevea D'Souza, who just graduated from our program and is our fourth coach. Um, my, myself, Liz, and John all have an extensive club coaching background. Um, we coach for years in club, um, coach national team members. Um, I've coached in the Olympic Games. Liz was a national team member, a world team member. She's currently a Brevet judge, uh, still judging in the elite world and, and, and working with national teams. Um, so I hope that people recognize that and are also drawn to the fact that, you know, we will still teach you gymnastics when you get here. That's a huge part of our program, you know, and when we're recruiting people, we're looking for passionate learners, for people that want to continue to stretch and grow outside their comfort zone and not just come to college and have the status quo of, of this is what I've got and I'm going to do for four years, but I'm going to keep learning new skills and getting better. And you know, we work on new things every day. And, you know, I recall last year, we're in the last few days of training before we head out to Texas for the national championships, you know, and I look over and, and Liz has everybody on beam doing three part series and new things on the floor and the low beam and, and putting things from floor to high beam. And we're not stopping that progress just because we have a competition. And that's a, a big goal and mission of our program. Um, you know, we have this one day better mantra of our team and it's really the foundational principle of our program um, and one day better to us is intentionally looking for ways to improve every single day and opportunities to grow and that doesn't stop because you have a competition that doesn't stop because you come to college that doesn't stop because you've graduated um, that doesn't stop because you're a brother a sister a parent um, you know it's a lifelong mission yeah and we're looking for recruits that are going to embrace that mission and that culture. And I think that when they come and meet our staff, see our program, meet our team, tour the university, that they really get a sense that we are living that one day better mission um, and that that's for them. And do you feel like it's, it's not a place where culture in regards to have like a negative um culture gets to fester just because of how intentional you guys are in one, the recruiting process, but even in the development that you guys have, you had mentioned talking about people who are wanting to be continuous learners and wanting to continue to grow rather than just either being there or arrived or feel like they're maxed out of their potential or coming in maxed out. And they just have to maintain that. Um, I had talked about this with another coach, um, you know, and I probably already know the answer to it based off of what you've already said, but say you had an athlete coming in and they will go anywhere from a nine, seven, five to a nine, eight, five, but you have to choose another athlete who can go nine, nine, five and above consistently on the same event, you know, but that nine, nine, five athlete may have some things, you know, about them where they're just content, right? They're content with just being able to do that. And it allows them to be able, because they know they can hit there. Uh, it allows them to be able to have more freedom to kind of socialize and experience more within college. But yet you have the one who's a 975, 985, who probably can't beat out that 995, but is always wanting to learn. If you were to choose between the two athletes, you know, would you want the one who can hit and be, be the, um, uh, think about like contributing to the the competition in gymnastics or the one who's 
you know, their, their nature is to want to continue to develop and then get there. Say they get there by their senior year. Which one of those two are you more in your staff would gravitate towards? Well, certainly in the recruiting process, we're going to gravitate towards the person that wants to continue to grow and, and improve and is really showing that every day in practice. And we're going to see that in competition just, just by, you know, watching that steady improvement. Um, and, and, and so, I mean, I'm happy to tell you that we don't have a lot of complacency in our program. So in our program, we're not faced to make those choices very often. And if we did have somebody that, that, was seemingly complacent and maybe not putting the work in, then that would be a conversation that we need to have about, you know, let's talk about the core values of our team. Let's talk about the one day better mission. Why have we strayed a little bit away from that? Um, and, and so, you know, we, we look to our one day better mission and our core values of joy, humility, inclusivity, commitment, adaptability, those are our core values, and and we look to those to make every single decision that we make on our team. And so it becomes really, really easy to have conversations and to help guide student athletes in a certain direction when we are anchored to one day better and those core values. Um, and so th those are the conversations that we would be having. Um, sometimes in college, you know, when you think about difficulty and maybe a routine that's a little bit more simple, but but better executed and making those types of decisions, sometimes you have to play the game. Yeah. And, you know, that was something that I struggled with when I came in as a club coach uh, in 2011 to Cal. Um, you know, I wanted to j just like we did in level 10 elite to keep pushing difficulty and OK, it's all right. We're going to go out in every competition and we're going to try that. And if you fall, no big deal. We're going to get back into the gym and we're going to make it better. And when we get to the end of the season, it's going to be there or next year it's going to be there. Yeah. And unfortunately, in college, we don't have that luxury. You know, your, your rankings start from the very first weekend out. And you have to have a strong showing every single weekend. And so I learned pretty quickly, um, you know, that that execution and consistency is absolutely the most important thing um, when you're talking about building a really strong scoring base for your team as you head in, you know, from the beginning all the way through to the end. And you want to put yourself in a great position um, seating wise when, when you're looking at the postseason. Um, so we absolutely have to make some choices sometimes where we're playing the game versus, man, I really want that kid to do a layout full out instead of a stuck double layout. Um you know, but that's what, that's the best decision for our team at that yeah. point. Yeah. And even talking about seeding, the uh, BCS championships so the college championships just uh, concluded this Monday. Mm -hmm. And in gymnastics, you know, you had kind of talked about you're getting ranked right away. Can you talk about the process of even just how ranking really influences the, the, the landscape of things and even wins and losses in gymnastics, does it have the same impact where in football, if I have certain wins and losses, it puts me out of the, uh, it doesn't give me an opportunity to either, excuse me, get to the championship game or even the playoffs and, or um, get to certain bowl games that might just be a little bit more viewed. Right. Um, and so can you kind of talk about how that process works, you know, um, for those who may not really understand how many people may make it to postseason and, you know, does wins and losses really, really um, impact where you could go? Or is it about just the scores that you get and you just happen to compete a, a, against some of the top schools in the in the country and you might either be on the short end of it or you might be on the better end of it? Yeah, it, you know, gymnastics is really interesting in, in that regard. Um, wins and losses are more for bragging rights than anything else. You know, you you could theoretically lose every competition, but score really, really high and still be ranked, you know, in, in the top 10 and, and above. And that's going to set you up for the postseason, you know, as you move forward. And, and, and you know, the, the wins and losses – don't really mean anything until you get to regionals and you need to be in that top two to advance to the national championships. So um, we, we never focus on trying to beat another team. We always try to focus on getting better and improving our score each time we go out and compete. 
of course we want to win. You know, right. everybody wants to win and go out and compete. Um, and I think that sometimes for administrators that aren't really familiar with gymnastics, that whole idea of the wins and losses not being as heavily weighted as the scores are is, is something that they have to learn. Um, but of course, we want to be able to write a press release that says, you know, we won that competition. Right. Um, but it's 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 definitely different than, you know, most other sports. Right. No. And. I think it's important for people to know too, because sometimes not really understanding the process they made, um, because in most sports, wins and losses really do make an impact, right? And as you mentioned, in gymnastics, it doesn't. And um, can you kind of also talk about the structure? Because when I was coaching college gymnastics and I had a couple opportunities, one as an assistant at a division three, as well as a volunteer at Utah State, kind of understanding you know, when you're competing where certain wins matter in regards to how you get ranked, right? It's like if you are not necessarily wins, but certain scores, if you get them at home or on the road, how that impacts even your ranking. And can you kind of talk about even that or even not necessarily the strategy behind it, but kind of how that is calculated for someone who follows the sport, but, but may not really understand that piece? Certainly you, um, you have your, your six scores. Um, so we have something called the NQS that is essentially our ranking and we have to have three away scores that count in that, in those top six scores. So you can't count more than three home scores. Um, you know, theoretically there, there's thought behind sometimes it's a little bit easier to compete at home in front of your home crowd and that maybe the the scores might be a little bit elevated and then it can be harder when you're competing on the road um, and so there's a little bit more weight to those away scores um, you know it's interesting for our team this year we we spend our first three weeks out on the road um, so our strategy is we would like to get some some good meets under our belt on the road and have those as counting scores. Um, so that puts us in a position, not where we can, you know, take our foot off the gas, but we can be a little bit more comfortable as we move into the rest of the season and start competing at home. So certainly the away scores are, are very, very important in terms of that NQS. Um, and then after you have those six scores, uh, you drop your high and you average the five, and then that gives you your NQS score. Um, typically that's happening um, a little bit towards the midpoint of the season after everybody has enough meets um, in to have an NQS and then you're using that NQS for ranking. So right now we're based on straight averages until we have enough scores to um, turn into the NQS total um, that we'll use as we head into the postseason. And is strength of schedule something that is thought about when you're thinking about or because it depends on your conference because some conferences pick your schedule. I don't know really for gymnastics how it works. Can you kind of dive into that? And even if it's strength of schedule is something that is um, important in the process of competition. Yeah, we have. So we're currently in the Pac-12 schedule. Um, you know, next year we will be in the ACC. So we'll be seeing some different teams. Um, the conference sets a good portion of the schedule, um, typically starting about the third week of of the season, um, depending on what conference you're in. Um, and so you will be meeting everybody in your conference during that time. So you have a couple of meets on the front end and maybe one or two meets on the back end, depending on how your schedule is, that you can compete out of conference. And so for us, we look at those out of conference opportunities um, and, and that's where kind of the strength of schedule comes into play. It's not something that anybody is looking at in terms of ranking. But, you know, for us internally, we want to make sure that we're going out and competing against the top teams in the country so that our team is really, you know, seeing the best of the best and, and being prepared and, and knowing how competitive it's going to be as we head into regionals and eventually the national championship. So competing against the best teams in the country are going to make us the most prepared. And so we work outside of our conference schedule to make sure that we're seeing a lot of those teams. Um, this season, you know, we've started off at the Super 16 that we talked a little bit about, very strong meet. Um, this weekend, we're going to Utah for the uh, Sprouts Collegiate Challenge, and that's also an ESPN meet. Um, going to be a lot of great teams there, so that's going to give us the opportunity to see a lot of teams that are outside of our conference. 
Um, and, and then we start our schedule at Washington and we start the Pac-12 play. Um, and then we head through to regionals. We are hosting regionals this year, so we're excited to be a regional host. Um, and then national championships are are back in Fort Worth. And can you also talk about your staff? You had mentioned them earlier already, but can you talk specifically about what their roles are gymnastics wise and events that they coach, but also what they bring to the gymnastics team personality wise and even leadership wise? Yeah, John Carney, uh, who's our assistant coach, is going to be a second season with us. Uh, we've known John for a long time. He he coached club up in Region 2 and was successful as a club coach and then uh, was at Oregon State and then Missouri just before he came to Cal. Um, he's an excellent bar coach. Um, he coaches bars for our team. Um, I would say that, you know, his, his strengths are, you know, technical ability to teach skills, you know, a good attention to detail and, and holding the gymnast accountable for those details. He also brings a lot of fun and a lot of humor and, and games and things to his rotations that keep the athletes motivated and interested in what's going on while still really delivering good quality of work. Um, Liz, co-head coach, as I mentioned, we're married. Um, we coach club for a long time together. Um, you know, we kind of share a brain in, in that sense. And so that makes it really nice for just when we're planning and, and developing things in the gym, we're, we're kind of always are on the same page with each other. Um, she coaches beam and floor does all of our choreography as well um you know her her strength is absolutely technical she's a fantastic technical coach um she's really really good at getting athletes outside of their comfort zone as well and and just bringing out the artistry in their gymnastics um i mentioned that she's a, a brevet judge and so she judges fig competitions um you know championships olympic trials at that level so she constantly has that lens that she's looking through as well, um, which I think is incredibly helpful. Um, she's a really, really good balance of, you know, of, of looseness and energy, but also, um, you know, strict in terms of, of the, the detail work and, and working a lot of basics. Um, I coach vault and floor. So Liz and I kind of share floor. Um, vault is a, is a passion of mine. I I, I love coaching vault. Um, I was the gymnast. I did collegiate gymnastics at San Jose State, and I was not a super strong athlete in terms of leg power. And so going back to club, I, I always was on a mission to help athletes that weren't super strong in their legs find ways to be super technically efficient so that they could get something done. You know, you have that level nine that's struggling to get to level 10, and they want to learn a Yurchenko full. How are we going to how are we going to get this kid to, to be efficient with what they're doing? Because they don't always have the leg power, especially on, you know, a tired day. That's where I found a lot of joy in, in coaching that event. And so um, we made the decision several years ago um, to take me off of bars and, and for me to go to vault because we, we were lacking in, in the vaulting area and we really needed to improve there. Um, and so uh, we made a switch and, um, I still absolutely love coaching bars. I mean, one of the things that's special about our program is that everybody coaches everything. Yeah. Yes, John is on bars. Yes, Liz is primarily on beam and helping with floor. And I'm primarily on vault and helping with floor on the non-vault days. But we also have our head on a swivel and we are coaching everything. If you see something, you say something. Yeah. We don't have egos. This is not my event. You can't come over here and help. Um, so we're constantly seeing something, you know, I may be on floor and I see something on bars and I run over to John or the athlete and say, Hey, have you thought about this? Don't forget about this. Let's try this drill really quickly because it pops into my head and I think it's going to help. And I want them, I want the athlete to get that information. Liz and John do the same thing. And I think that that's pretty special. Um, I, I love technical basic gymnastics. Um, you know, I kind of nerd out on that stuff. I'm still a student of the sport. I'm constantly on the internet, um, which is so cool because, you know, when I first started coaching, people didn't share information the way that they do now. Right. Everything was a secret. Yeah. And so it was constantly trial and error in your own lab in the gym. And, you know, now we have these po great podcasts and we have Instagram and we have all of these things from around the world that are at our fingertips. 
And so I spend a lot of time just kind of geeking out on that stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to try this tomorrow. You know, and I don't know if our girls love it or hate it, but I come in the next day and I'm like, all right, here's what we're doing today. And we're going to try this outlandish thing because I really think that it's going to help one athlete on the team. Um, but I love the structure of basics. I love the consistency of basics and making sure that we are at least touching those things every day, whether it's five minutes or 15 minutes, because I know in the long run that it's going to pay off. Yeah. And then we have uh, Nevea D'Souza, who's our fourth coach, who just graduated. She's highly decorated Cal gymnast, you know, many all American many times over. Um, and so she brings a, a, a youthful energy and, and a connection of really knowing what it's like to be a team member yeah. and, and kind of bringing that perspective to the coaching staff, which I think is, has been incredibly helpful already. She's learning a ton. Um, and, you know, she, she sometimes is coaching an event by herself. Sometimes she's working with um, me, Liz or John, just so that she's continuing to learn. Um, but it's been a lot of fun having her be a part of our staff. Um, and also talking about just youthfulness and even your your staff having so much club experience, seeing the landscape of how gymnasts now are re not really resurrecting, but you could kind of say resurrecting a elite career after college gymnastics from a club coach perspective, kind of seeing athletes not, you know, uh, not just kind of like just retire from the sport, but have opportunities to either represent their country if they have dual citizenship somewhere um you know can you kind of talk about that and from your perspective um what you kind of think about that and even just having the opportunity being a a college coach to be able to also coach the athletes at that um platform as well and not only um limited to just having to coach them as a collegiate athlete i i think it's awesome that we have so many athletes now. I mean, first of all, you know, back in the day, elite gymnasts typically stopped their career at elite gymnastics. You know, they also didn't have the opportunities to come in with, with NIL and those types of opportunities um, that they do now, which I think has, has been really, really positive. Then you started seeing athletes that finished their elite career and, and wanted to do college and, and really were thriving in college. I think that was the first step. Um, and then you had some some athletes a long time ago that, you know, Mohini Bahardwaj was one of them that went back, you know, after her college career and 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 made the Olympic team. And you 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 started to have that trend. And and now we have this situation where you have US athletes that are still continuing to compete their elite career. You have a lot of college athletes that have dual citizenship in other countries and have those opportunities. And I think it's amazing. And I think it's amazing that. We've gotten to a place in coaching gymnastics where athletes are more healthy and they have more longevity in the sport maybe than they used to. I mean, yeah. you've seen it in other countries for a long time that that athletes are competing, you know, way up into their 40s, some of them. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really, really fun. And I think it brings a whole new um, excitement to collegiate athletics from a coaching perspective, it also brings a lot of great opportunities. You know, I had the opportunity when I came to college, um, a few years into my, the beginning of my head coaching career, we had a, a young woman named Tony Ann Williams on our team who competed in the Olympics for Jamaica. And when we recruited her, we knew that, um, you know, she had been to a couple world championships and we knew that that was her goal. And, you know, we had sat down with, with Tony and her family and said, we absolutely support it. We absolutely can help you on this journey. We have the experience to do it. And um, we understand that it's also going to look a little bit different from the college training plan. Um, and there may be some opportunities where you're you're competing for Jamaica and not for our college team, and we're going to be okay with that. And so the first time that we made it to the national championship since 1992, we didn't have Tony with us. She helped us get there. She competed all the way through the regional to help us get there. And then she went and competed in the Olympic test event um, and, and competed and, and qualified to the Olympic games while we were competing in, in uh, Fort Worth at the national championships. Wow. Um, and so that was amazing. You know, she, she helped us get there and then 
we went off and did our thing as a team and she went off and, and continued to pursue a, a lifelong goal, made the Olympics. And then I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to get to go and coach her in Rio. And it was a fabulous experience. Um, and that also gave a lot of notoriety to our program too, that, you know, Cal now has an Olympian on, on the women's side. And so that opened up many, many doors. You know, now people look at our program and think, okay, I could go to Cal and I could continue to do my elite career. I could continue to pursue these dreams because the coaches support it. The staff can help us train at that level. Um, and it's already been done. And yeah. we do have some current athletes on our team that, that have some of those aspirations and are um, working towards those goals. And then we have to find a balance as a coaching staff to allow them some opportunity to continue to up their level gymnastically. So they have what they need for, for FIG and balance what they need for NCAA. And, and it's tricky, but it can definitely be done. And, you know, we're happy to, to do it. And was it quite the transition going from club coaching and doing it at a high level, as well as coming and then transitioning into the collegiate world where one, you may not have had the same amount of time allotted to be able to do gymnastics, where in college, you only have 20 hours to do anything gymnastics related. That's not only the training, correct? Um, yeah, the, the countable, they're called CARA hours. And so the, the countable athletic related activity can only be 20 hours. Um, it was a huge change for me. Um, you know, I was a, I was a gymnast, as I mentioned, I did collegiate gymnastics at San Jose state, uh, back when they had a men's program. Um, I, I started my club career in, in Oklahoma where I was born. We moved out to California when I was 15. I did club gymnastics at Stanford and had, um, amazing club coaches that really taught me the value of basics in gymnastics um, and had, had a, a wonderful collegiate experience. Absolutely loved the growth of being a college athlete, loved my teammates. And I loved helping coach my teammates in college. You know, I wasn't the most talented athlete on the team, but I always felt like I had a gift for seeing gymnastics in my mind. And Liz and I joke all the time that we feel like we see gymnastics in slow motion. Mm. And, and so we were able to, to, to really tune into that as coaches. And it kind of started with coaching um, my teammates. Never really had plans of, of being a coach necessarily. I, I thought I wanted to go to physical therapy school and that was the track that I was on. And I finished my eligibility and I had a little, uh, I, I needed to work now. And I was still finishing a couple classes. And at the time, uh, a, a club called Airborne Gymnastics uh, down in Santa Clara, um, I, I subbed there a little bit. I ended up getting a job. And a few years later, I had the opportunity to start coaching the level nines and tens. And I absolutely fell in love with it. And I never looked back. I was there for over 15 years. And then I went straight to coaching college. Um, just felt like I needed a little bit of a different opportunity at that time in my life. And so I came in as an assistant coach that first year at Cal. And I remember having all these college athletes, you know, I don't remember how many we had on the roster at the time, but let's say there was about, about 18 of them. And you have 18 girls on your team who were coached 18 different ways, learned skills, 18 different ways. Yeah. And I was like, Oh my gosh, how do you do this? Because I was so used to a being, I, I only had one job before that. And that was coaching at this club. Yeah. And I was responsible for the development of these athletes all the way through until they went to college. And that was our system in the gym. And that's what I knew. And I had specific ways that I like to teach skills and teach basics. And so now I'm like, oh my gosh, it, it was just like in my mind chaos because there yeah. wasn't a lot of, of structure of my order of things. And so I had right. to learn really, really quickly. Okay, I only have this much time. You know, we're, we're going from a five hour practice in club to now a three hour practice that's really about two and a half hours because you have warm up and conditioning and that sort of thing. You have 30 minute rotations. Some days you have 45 minute rotations. And I have all of these things where I, I want to start implementing my own system. How am I going to do this? Mm -hmm. So I had to learn really, really quickly. You can there's only so many battles that you can choose. Right. You know, um, 
Are, are you really going to completely reconstruct and change somebody's round off when they're 20 years old? Hmm. I thought I could in the beginning. And I realized quickly that there were a few things that you could focus on to make what they already have maybe better and more efficient, but you can't start over from scratch. You yeah. just don't have enough time. Um, and in the summer, it's all voluntary. And so that's also makes it difficult too, because in club in the summer, all right, this is where we're really breaking things down. We're learning new things. I have this whole plan. And now it's, well, if you'd like to do this, you can. Yeah. And if you would like my help, ask me for it and I will help you. Yeah. Um, so it took a number of years to really figure out that balance and how, how I was going to make the biggest impact possible. Right. And, and I feel now, you know, almost 13 years later that I'm starting to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and I being a club coach now, that's one thing that I struggle with is because prior to me getting to the club level, I was coaching high school gymnastics where it was a bit different. You're trying to almost do your best because you had a, a time restriction because they didn't they weren't in as many hours. The commitment wasn't as great as it is in club. And then I went from so high school gymnastics to um, collegiate gymnastics. And so I got a taste of a little bit higher level. And then when I got to club, you know, I was like, all right, you got to be more technical. You got to do this. And you saw athletes who, you know, when either they were from different clubs and they happened to be at the club I was at and they had, you know, certain habits like, you know, they would start tumbling and say they start in the corner, but they would finish almost 90 degrees, you know, to the left or to the right because their hurdle was so crooked, you know, that it turn everything that way or they had deficiencies on one side I was like all right we got to fix this kid right now and they're 15 years old and they say they want to be a collegiate level 10 and man I remember my first season I screwed up so many of our level 10s just because I came in I was like you have to be more technical if you say you want to go to this school you have to be like this and I didn't understand at that time I didn't have the experience I didn't have the maturity to think hey you know you almost have to deal with it during the season and just fix the things that aren't extremely technical, but like can clean up stuff, right? You just fix, you know, the straight arms, you know, the handstand shape a little bit, but the timing, if you started messing with the timing of stuff, they lost releases or they right. couldn't land their, their tumbling passes or their vaults. They had no idea where they were. And so that was something I really needed to understand and Coming now where I'm, you know, being able to develop athletes to hopefully get there, I still kind of feel like, man, you know, how can I get these level threes, level fours to have a, a strong front walkover? So when they go to beam and they need to do a front aerial or, you know, whatever the case may be, that it will be there and have the patience and to be able to develop those things. But at the same time, be like, all right, maybe that's not in their cards to do and just kind of scratch that and let's work on their strengths and make those things really strong and make it to wherever they want to go. They have a arsenal of things that are, you know, competitive and will get them to where they ultimately have. Do yeah. You, ever... you, you kind of have to adopt the mentality of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. You know, and, and right. that was something that I had to learn too, is wow, this athlete actually does this skill really, really well. It's dynamic. There's really not a lot of deductions. Are there some little things, like you said, that we can tweak here and there? And is it really worth deconstructing that one piece that you think is so important that maybe they're not doing your way, but they are getting it done? And yeah. so- you know, learning to look at things through that lens has really, really been important as a college coach. And I think that if I went back and I was coaching club again, I would bring a lot of that with me because I think sometimes as a club coach, um, you, I know that I did, could, could stifle an athlete's progress a little bit because you're so rigid on, I want the hurdle to look like this. Yeah. Right. And can you even talk about the balance of being technical? Because you talk about your staff being really technical, but also like the balance of executing skills, like doing skills, but also doing drills and shaping and stuff like that and finding that balance. Because you have experience, obviously, in club with high levels and 
in uh, college where you're at a, a university that does pretty well, do you, are you able to balance where you're like, all right, you know what, we need to get certain releases or, you know, or on vault, we need to get certain things done where you're able to be like, okay, spend so much time, drill, 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 or just, you know what, let's go on the event and say on vault, let's go into the pit and just kind of throw it and kind of figure it out as we go. Can you talk about the balance both in club, but also in college to do those two things? Yeah. Um, I coach a lot off of gut and, and just feeling, um, especially when I'm making assignments and things. Um, you know, right now, just being in that competitive phase um, and, and needing to build consistency, I still think it's important that we have some basics and some drilling every day. Now, some days that's really fast. Some days that's five minutes. It's prescribed. It's written on the board. You're going to do these things because that's a part of our daily prep work and it's kind of non-negotiable. Um, and then we get right to the skills that we need to, you know, attack for competition. Other days it's, okay, we're going to spend a complete 45 minute rotation and all we're going to do is basics and technical work. And that might be 15 minutes of drilling this. And that might be 15 minutes of drilling this. And then that's, you know, if it's vault for me going up and we're just doing stack mats and we're working on, on finding those pieces that we were just working down on the floor and applying them to what we're doing up there. Um, and I like to take people in and out of their comfort zone. We talked a little bit about that. Um, yeah. you know, sometimes you'll, you'll have an athlete that, um, learned a skill and maybe after they learned it and have great ownership over it, they, they haven't gone back to those root skills for quite some time. So I'd like to go back to those root skills and they may not always love it, but we, we push them to do that. And then once they kind of get those light bulb moments of this is helping, um, you know, now, now we're working a little bit more in partnership for those things. Right. Um, and you know, I still, you know, I believe when you're twisting, you should know how to do a half. You should know how to do a full. You should know how to do a one and a half. You should know how to do a double. We call it the ladder going yeah. up and down the ladder of twisting. Right. Um, so it, it just kind of depends on the day and how I'm feeling. Like I try to take an inventory of what have we looked like in the past week? If it's competitive season, what do we look like in that last meet and where was the breakdown happening? And then I've got to ask myself the question, what have we not done in quite a while mm. that's leading to that? Yeah. I, I take a lot of personal responsibility when things aren't going well with the team gymnastically Yeah, because our team works really hard and they're really, really motivated to get better. And so as a staff, we sit down and we meet and say, all right, what have we not done that we were doing three weeks ago that was really making an impact and why have we gotten away from doing that? And then we try to get back to that place. So it's a constant ebb and flow. You know, you're talking about the balance. It is a balance. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's really, really important as a staff to be able to recognize when we need to make some adjustments Yeah. and that ultimately we're, we are responsible for setting out that plan, you know, for our gymnasts to, to execute each week. Right. And even talking about, plans in the recruiting process when you are committing an athlete especially to a uh, a scholarship at cal specifically how do you guys structure it if you offer an athlete a scholarship is it a guaranteed four-year scholarship or is it a year-to-year -year basis that you guys kind of do and then do you also have um within just like recruiting do you guys now that the transfer portal has been something that has been you know a little bit more active you know, in recent time, I know it's something that's always been a thing where people transfer. Um, and how does that even work when you're um, transfers? And even with like COVID being a big reason why people transferred because of either the um, extra year and being able to have that eligibility where, you know, their university that they may ha have competed for four years may not have um money for them to be able to continue. And so they do, you know, pursue all that. Can you kind of just talk about what that looks like when you are offering someone a scholarship? Yeah, typically for us, a scholarship offer is four years. Um, you know, we are generally looking for all arounders first, um, you know, just to, to try to have viable um, athletes on all four events. Um, occasionally, 
you know, there, there's someone who's an absolute superstar on one or two events that, that we would consider offering a scholarship to. Um, but, but typically um, we're looking for someone who's really, really strong and we believe can make an impact immediately on, on at least three events, three or four events. Um, and um, we are generally offering four-year scholarships to those athletes. Um, outside of the, the skill piece, and I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but we're, we're looking for athletes that are passionate about learning and challenges. You know, Cal is a really, really strong academic institution. So you need to make sure that you're wanting to come in and be challenged academically. Um, and you need to be the right fit for our culture. You know, that one day better piece. And, um, you know, now that you've heard a little bit kind of the, the way that we coach gymnastics and the way that we hope that everyone is going to want to continue to learn and kind of stretch themselves. We're yeah. looking for those pieces. Um, in addition to that, the artistry and execution piece is, is a staple in our program. Yeah. And that's what we are drawn to when someone has great form and excellent toe point, um, you know, does those pieces really, really dynamically, um, those are really, really important to our staff and to our program. Um, and I think that, you know, hopefully everybody sees that when you see our team compete, um, that, that those details are, are really, really focused on. Yeah. Um, and then the, 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 the transfer piece, um, you know, the transfer portal has absolutely gotten more active over the last several years. And I think you're right. Some of that is, is COVID related and, and extra eligibility. Um, we have had the strategy over the last few years of really trying to continue to build our base of freshmen coming in. Um, and, and so that's kind of where we have put our focus. Yeah. Um, but you know, the transfer portal is, is certainly, um, a thing and it's, and it's active and it's something that we keep our eye on, um, you know, as, as each season goes by. And the final thing really related to Cal, at least gymnastics wise, um, is the NIL with NIL deals. Is there opportunities at Cal to, to do so? And if so, are there athletes who are either coming in with communications about that questions about that or already deals, or even is there opportunities right now where athletes have deals and something to pursue. And I, I can already assume how it affects the culture of your program. Cause you, we already, you already talked about it and you have great people as athletes that really kind of are in a place where they really understand why they're there. But can you kind of talk about what NIL looks like at Cal? Because I know every state um, has different rules and regulations and how that may work. Yeah, we, we, you know, Cal Athletics has a, well, not Cal Athletics, but there is a, um, a collective that's associated um, with, with Cal that is the Legends Collective. And, um, you know, coaches are not allowed to, we can't broker any NIL deals. Um, we, we can't push anybody towards those things. Um, and, and oftentimes we don't even know exactly what's happening unless an athlete would tell us. Um, so, you know, we have one of the things that we do have in our department that I think is really helpful towards NIL is NIL education. Um, we have classes that are about building your personal brand um, because we want our student athletes to be well educated in that space so that when opportunities are there for them and, and there are opportunities that are there for them, um, they know how to look at those opportunities and how to navigate that space the best of their ability um, and, and so that they can thrive. And certainly we want them to, but um, we are not, as coaches, we're not involved in that space at all. Um, but the the collective is. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And kind of transferring or as we kind of transfer into the academic side of it, can you kind of talk about what the enrollment looks like at Cal, the campus size, and then even just the academic degree degrees that really come out of there that are really known across the country or even the world that people go to Cal to pursue and kind of get jobs from? Because you had mentioned that it's the number one public university in the country. And so can you kind of talk about what makes it that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cal, Cal's a really, really special place. And, and one of the things that, that I love about it is that every Everybody there, students, athletes, staff, professors, 
um, everybody is there to challenge themselves. And there are so many people on our campus that are literally changing the world um, in the in the biotech space, in, in the health and medical space, in the technology space. So when you're a student here, if you immerse yourself in the Cal culture and utilize all the resources that are available to you, you're going to be exposed to so many amazing people and amazing opportunities that are going to set you up for the rest of your life. Um, currently on our team, we have a lot of um, bio-centered majors, nutritional science. Um, we have several in the engineering school. Um, we have some that are interested in pursuing business degrees. So we have a, a pretty good, um, you know, broad-based interest within our program. And and Cal is a, a broad-based learning institution. So, I mean, anything that you want to study, you're, you're going to find that here. Um, being in Silicon Valley and 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 being in a, in a tech heavy location, you know, there's certainly a lot of computer engineering and and um, computer science um, that that people are studying here. Um, lots and lots of bio and chemistry and and I mean, really, you can you can find it all. Yeah. Um, we have an incredible amount of um, Nobel laureates, um, folks that have won Nobel prizes yeah. that are are active and teaching on our campus, and so. Um, it's not out of the realm of possibilities that one of your professors may be a Nobel Prize winner, um, you know, which is pretty cool. Um, you have people to the right and the left of you that are are going to be changing the world someday. And, and so, um, you know, post-graduation, you, you may know, um, you know, the next CEO of a startup that um, changes the world. Um, so it's a, it's a very, you know, a, a very exciting yet challenging place to be. Yeah. Um, there are about uh, roughly 40,000 students at Cal. Um, it's a pretty big university. We're located in the San Francisco Bay Area. So we are literally right across the bay from San Francisco. So most places on our campus, we have a very hilly campus. So if you're at the top of the campus where the football stadium is, our high performance center is there and, and our training facility is up there. Uh, you look to the west and you see the bay, you see the water, you see the Golden Gate Bridge, you see the skyline of the city. Um, we're only about 25 minutes away from San Francisco. So um, our team, you know, can hop on public transportation or drive across the Bay Bridge and be in the heart of San Francisco really quickly. Um, you know, we have lots of different professional sports teams. We're 45 minutes from beaches. We are two and a half hours away from mountains. So Really, anything that that you would like to experience, uh, we're we're in very close proximity to, and um, so the Bay Area has an incredible amount to offer, and it's one of the reasons why Liz and I have been here for so long, and and absolutely love it. And even just talking about now, you and Liz, can you kind of you talked about your story a little bit, kind of how you started your gymnastics. Um, can you kind of talk about, you know, what really got you into really coaching and you mentioned it just a little bit but was this something when you were younger as a kid starting your gymnastics you thought you know what I want to do this and I know you wanted to uh, become a physical therapist you mentioned that a little bit but you know as a kid when you're asked what do you want to be when you grew up was being a gymnastics coach especially a college gymnastics coach one of those things on your list uh, it was not one of those things on my list um I started gymnastics. I, I was in Oklahoma and I had some friends in the neighborhood that did gymnastics and they convinced me to come to a, a practice with them. Um, we lived in this little town called Enid, Oklahoma. Um, there wasn't a lot there and there was a gymnastics club. It actually was run out of the National Guard Armory. And on the weekends, they had to completely tear down the, the facility and, and it turned into a, a training ground for the National Guard. And then it would on that Monday, it would go back to being a gymnastics facility again. And so I, I went to this, this practice and um, absolutely fell in love with it. You know, just flipping upside down, jumping on the trampoline. Um, I just, I'd never experienced anything like it. And so that, that feeling of moving my body through space freely um, and then ultimately learning things that nobody else could do. Yeah. You know, I mean, gymnasts can do so many cool things that so many people cannot. And um, I, I just thought that was super cool. And then I really gravitated early. I had mentioned that I wasn't like a super powerful. I wasn't a really, really strong kid. Yeah. Um, gymnastics gave me a lot of confidence because I got a lot stronger. Yeah. 
And I gravitated to the artistic side of the sport. I had really good form naturally. I had good flexibility naturally. So I found out really quickly as a compulsory athlete, if you do these things well, you will score high and you will win medals. And that is fun. And, 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 and so I gravitated towards that and then struggled a little bit as I got into like optional level gymnastics because you had to be stronger. So I had to put a lot more time and effort into strength and conditioning and, and building some power. Um, but again, I, I loved the challenge of, of feeling like there was something that maybe I was too afraid to do or wasn't strong enough to do, or it was just going to be too challenging and not giving up and every single day, try a little bit more, try a little bit more. And then eventually you get it. And that satisfaction of making that skill for the first time, catching your first release move. I mean, I'll never forget when I caught a ginger. That was the first release move I, I learned. And I'm sure it was super scrappy and close to the bar, but my dowels <laughs> went onto that bar and I didn't come off. And like, yeah. I, I'm 50 years old. I will never forget that feeling. Mm. And so I, I lived for that. And then when I got into college, that's when I started to learn the love for the coaching part yeah. that there were a lot of things that I couldn't do that I was trying to do. And I just couldn't do them as well as my teammates did. Yeah. But I could totally understand how it worked and I could watch a teammate do something and go, you know what, if you, you know, if you're on P bars, if you just, you know, swing your toes up a little higher on that Diamondoff, you're, it's, you're going to finish right in handstand, yeah. those sorts of things. And I started to learn how to spot a little bit. And and then, like I said, I, I started coaching at airborne and um, I had coached boys prior to that um, a little bit. It was compulsory level boys. The difference between a 10 year old boy and a 10 year old girl is like different planets. Mm. 10 year old boy, you're saying, stop kicking your friend, <laughs> listen to what's going on. You, you know, you're just trying to, to keep them um, yeah. involved in the practice. And I remember subbing the first time at Airborne, it was level eight, nines and tens. And I was helping with floor. And there were all these little girls that were lined up, ready to go, listening and and working incredibly hard. And you ask them to try something and they did it yeah. and did it with intention. And I was like, wow, this is this is incredible to be able to give feedback to somebody and to have them reciprocate it and 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 you're working together and you're ap you're actually teaching somebody to get to the other side of that skill yeah and, and to learn something and 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 now they're learning confidence and it was just it was so much fun coaching the girls that I just never looked back yeah. and I decided okay PT school see you later I'm not doing that yeah. this is what I want to do for the rest of my life and I didn't think that coaching college was necessarily something that I wanted to do. Yeah. In fact, I had had a lot of opportunities in my club career to, you know, assistant jobs that had popped up that, that I had had some conversations about. And um, I wasn't thrilled about leaving California. That was one of them. Um, and I also just in my mind thought, I really love this de developmental piece. Oh. And I don't, I don't want to stop doing that. Um, and then when I eventually went to college and I realized that that development and that learning isn't stopping. Yeah. It, it, it might look a little bit different right. in the way that you approach it, um, but there's still a lot of opportunity to, to coach and to teach. And I absolutely love working with this, you know, young adult, you know, kind of 18 to 22 year old range. Um, I love the relationships um, that I have with our student athletes. That's probably one of the most rewarding pieces is right. the bond that you develop outside of gymnastics you know yeah. gymnastics is just a thing that we do um it's a game that we get to play yeah it's an opportunity you know it's something that brought them to the university and, and brought um all of us together yeah but we get to share in the in a short window in the lives of these young women and and hopefully make at least a little bit of a small impact um and and the relationships are just phenomenal i mean i have so much respect for college student athletes yeah. and, and, and certainly our team. I'm just incredibly proud of them. And, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about this particular team too, and, and where we're going to go this year. And what about Cal made it the right opportunity for you to get into the collegiate coaching realm? 
Well, um, California was one of them. I didn't have to go far. Um, you know, Cal is only about an hour from where I was living and had, had lived for a really long time. Um, I love the water. I love the ocean. Um, I've always been somewhere when we moved to California where I could get to the water quickly. Yeah. And so, you know, a little bit, I was living in Santa Cruz at the time, which I was like a mile from the ocean and I love to surf. And that was one of the reasons why I had lived in Santa Cruz. And I did kind of a big commute getting to the club I was working at, but I got to surf every day. Yeah. And so it's a little bit more challenging living in, in near Berkeley because we're on the Bay. Um, and so not quite as accessible to waves like I was in Santa Cruz, but I get to see the water every day and that still really feeds my soul. Yeah. Um, but Dana Durante uh, was the head coach at Cal and hired me. And I knew Dana just from years of, of coaching club. And I had sent a few athletes to Nebraska. Yeah. And so she reached out to me and said, Hey, I'm, I'm taking this job at Cal. I'd love for you to come up and work with me. What do you think? And I was ready. And so Liz and I discussed it. We thought, okay, this is the right opportunity. And we know that it may be a situation where you, you know, me, that I might have to move from job to job, being an assistant, who, who knows what that circuit looks like. And that Liz and I won't, might not be working together for a while, but we felt like that was a risk that was worth taking. And so um, it just felt right. And so I went up there, um, took the job, um, Dana and I, I loved working with Dana. It was a great first year and I learned a lot from her. And at the end of that season, she, um, left and, and went to Georgia. And so there was a search that was opened. I applied for the job and went through that whole process, which was also totally new to me. I mean, I don't think I'd ever had a real formal interview in my life. Yeah. And so, and now I'm interviewing with athletic directors and all kinds of different people for this job. Um, Fortunately, I got the job at the end of the search and I knew immediately that I wanted to hire Liz and um, also knew that there were going to be some some challenges with that and some hoops we had to jump through because we were married. Yeah. And I had to prove unequivocally that she was the right person for the job mm. outside of us being married. And that was really easy to do. Um, you know, I had a lot of supporting data to to back that up and. Fortunately, I was able to hire her. And so she came in that year and we went from uh, being 49th the year before that I was an assistant to 18th the next season. And um, the team hadn't made it to the postseason for quite some time since the uh, early to mid 2000s, hadn't made it to the national championship since 1992. And, you know, we progressively each year moved up, got ourselves into the top 10 made it to the national championships and, um, and, you know, have continued on that path every single year. We finished seventh last year. Uh, we're, we're this close to, uh, you know, being on the four on the floor on the final night. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, we, we won our regional last year and, and had the highest score in the country. And, and so um, it's been a real, like I look back on the journey of where this program was right. and where we are now. And it's amazing, you know, right. and I absolutely, there's no way in the world that this would happen without Liz. Yeah. Um, without the staff that we have had in the past and that we have now. Yeah. Um, and each year, um, you know, I, I fought for Liz to eventually become an associate head coach. Um, and then eventually the co-head coach, um, because, you know, we, we, we do everything together. We do yeah. everything equally. And, and I, I'm glad that our athletic director supported that idea. Yeah. And, and so here we are. Yeah. And you guys are amongst, you know, there's some historic couples that have been, you know, uh, coaches together at universities. And it seems though, when there's been that, there has been a lot of success that's come out, you know, especially when you guys are on the same page and you guys can almost take a lot of the family, family values that you guys have built between you and your couple and your, and your family and uh, apply a lot of those things to your um, gymnastics coaching. And, and almost like, instead of taking off certain hats, you can on, almost wear the same hat at all times and be able to make it work. Right. 
be able to know that you go, you guys are close and you guys can have your agreements, disagreements or whatever as coaches and as a couple and know that you guys know how to deal with those in different areas. And sometimes that could be hard if um, couples are not in sync like that. And, you know, how you mentioned um, your, your backing of, of, of her and who she is and what she could do. And even just fighting for her to be able to keep advancing just because the responsibilities that you guys have were the same. You guys think the same. I think that's really special and something, you know, um, to really be uh, appreciated, right? Cause it, it is hard even to this day to really have those opportunities and very rare just in sports to have the opportunities where you're able to work along your spouse and be able to do it at the high level and with someone who thinks very similar uh, to you without having it clash right yeah absolutely we you know one of the things that's really special and, and I think an advantage for us is that we because we are together all the time um, and and maybe sometimes this is a, a a downside and we have to work on not always talking about work and our team. Um, but we also have the opportunity to do that, you know, whether it's when we're having dinner or just when a thought comes into our mind, we can share it. You know, I mean, Liz will wake me up in the middle of the night sometimes and go, Oh my gosh, I just, I have to tell you this because I just had this thought come in my mind. We need to do this. And, and, you know, not everybody has that luxury. Um, and so that certainly helps, but, Liz is, is um, you know, in my opinion, she's the smartest person in the room. And, um, you know, everything, I, I bounce everything off of her and she bounces everything off of me. And so we're able to make really good, strong, confident decisions um, because we have been able to really think them through and give each other our opinions and perspectives on things to come up with the very best decision that we can. And what is one of your personal weaknesses and how do you and your team kind of help support your weakness so then it doesn't really affect what you guys are trying to do? Hmm. I One of my personal weaknesses is not living in the moment long enough. I tend to go to the next thing pretty quickly. Okay, I've done this task, now I'm to the next thing and now I'm to the next thing. And one of our goals this year as a team really coming from the team, but it certainly applies to me, is staying present and staying in the moment longer. And, and so that's something that I've had to work on. Um, I've had to work on delegating, um, you know, and Liz and I as a team have had to work on that too. For a long time, we didn't have an assistant coach. Mm. It was just me and Liz. And it was me and Liz coaching together um, in in, in club too. And, and so we, we have ha struggled sometimes saying, all right, we're going to take this off of our plate and we're going to allow these other people to handle them. And we have a great support staff. And, and so we have had to work really hard over the last several years, um, delegating things to other people and just trusting that, okay, yep, it's going to get done and it's going to get done to the highest level. Um, and and it, and it is, and it's really allowed us to our stress level to come down. And it's also allowed us to focus more on the things that we really need to focus on. Um, but I think for me, those are, those are definitely two things that I have had to learn to improve and, and I'm still working on. No, and it's, I think it's good to admit, because a lot of times we, as coaches in general, we have a lot of expectations or we have expectations in general from our athletes and we're looking for them to improve on their weaknesses. And that's why we do drills and basics and do the numbers that we do so then they can improve. And I think one of the biggest things as a leader that you can do is show an athlete the weaknesses that you do have and how you are working on improving those and just acknowledging them and for them to be able to do the same and know that, Hey, this is a weakness. And for me to either find a way to hide it or find a way to rectify it and make it something that will eventually be a strength of mine. And, and, communi of and communication is so important. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a huge, important part of our team. Um, it's a big, important part of our team culture. Um, you know, we we really, really try to make sure that our student athletes know that they can come to us and communicate to us about anything. And we are always open to feedback. I mean, we have reflective periods after every single competition. 
Um, you know, and we sit around in a circle and sometimes it's with our sports psychologist too. And we, we talk about the competitions and we talk about things we did not so great and the things that we did great. And, um, we encourage, you know, if there are things that our team feels like we could be doing better, we want to know that. Yeah. And, and so we also, as coaches, we have to be great listeners and we have to be able to accept feedback just like we give it to our team. And that's the only way that as a unit, we can continue to to grow and get better. Right. And I have a, two questions to kind of finish off. And then I'm going to have you kind of finish off by giving just kind of your last thoughts about um, just anything that you got, that you have on your mind to kind of share with the listeners and viewers. But these are two that kind of connect people and even just sports, but it's kind of outside of things. The first question is, if you could have anybody cook you a meal, anybody in the world, who would you have cook you that meal and what would you request of them to make you? I would have Liz cook me salmon. Um, her salmon is unbelievable. She uses like a, she does a mixture of like balsamic and olive oil and honey and honey mustard. Um, and, you know, brushes that on and just cooks it to perfection. And it's like mouthwatering. And, and I didn't, I was, haven't always been a salmon fan. Um, but I, I crave her salmon specifically all the time. And so any, any time, and, and we actually do eat salmon quite a bit. And so uh, anytime I get the opportunity that, that she makes that hands down. And did she grow up, uh, you know, around one of the coasts or in an area where salmon was something that... No, no. In fact, she's she is one of seven children, so a very large family. I'm the opposite. I'm an only child, um, which she gives me flack about all the time. <laughs> um, but fish wasn't something that in their family they ate a lot because they had such a big family, and fish can be expensive. So it really wasn't until um, you know her adult years that she started eating a lot more fish. Um, she loves salmon. We love sushi. Um, love seafood of all kind, but um, when she makes salmon, it's, you know, to me, it's unbelievable and it's absolutely my favorite meal. And that's cool that you love to share foods with the, you know, someone who's very close to you that again, you're doing life, not just at home, but also life at work. And I may be able to guess this next one who you would do it with. But my second question is <laughs> if you could see anybody live in concert and that's anybody dead or alive, who would you want to go see and who would you take with you? Well, you're right. It would absolutely, I would take Liz. Um, Liz and I love music. We love music. We love to dance. Um, you know, we, we go see a lot of live music and, you know, when the, when the pandemic and the world was shut down, that was one thing that, man, we missed so much was being able to go see music. I come from a long line of musicians. Um, my mom and dad were both opera singers and my mom was a, a music professor at a small university in Oklahoma for a long time. I grew up playing the violin. I played the guitar. I see your guitar hanging yeah. on the wall right there. Um, is that a bass? Uh, no, but I do I have a bass. That's over there. I have a, yeah, that's electric guitar. Okay. Um, so anyway, we lo absolutely love music. Um, so I, I have two answers for you. Um, just like somebody who's really popular right now, who I miss the opportunity to, miss the opportunity to see and is actually coming to play at Berkeley is Noah Kahn. Um, I, he's, I, I think he's fantastic. And I have his album, his most recent album. I, I listen to it a lot and our team actually loves him too. Um, we have a fantastic music venue um, called the Greek theater at Berkeley. And so anybody that you can think of rolls through and plays concerts there starting um, in the late spring and goes all the way through about October. And so we catch a lot of shows there. Um, and then my other answer would be Liz and I absolutely love Brandy Carlisle. And we would we've seen her a lot. And we would I would love to take Liz and go see her play at Red Rocks in Colorado. Bay Area is is a hub for music. I mean, San Francisco, Oakland, lots of great musicians that are coming out of this area. Um, so when we get the chance, especially when we're not in season, we try to see as much live music as we can. Um, it's something that we've always enjoyed doing together and, and, and always look forward to every single year. Yeah. 
And, you know, to kind of finish it off, is there anything that you kind of want to leave with the listeners and viewers, either just kind of some tidbits, advice, or even what you're excited about for this 2024 season with this team? Yeah. Um, so this is the 50th anniversary of our program that we're celebrating this year. So um, we're, we're, we're thrilled um, to really honor the program and everybody who has come before us. Um, we're thrilled to invite our alumni back. Our first home competition is January 27th against Oregon State, and that is our alumni meet. But we are also having a gala on the 26th um, that's going to be the 50th anniversary gala and celebration. So we're really excited about that and then just continuing to honor the program in 50 years you know, through this season. Um, and then we just recently launched on social media last week that we are um, completely renovating our facility. And we're really excited about this. Um, you know, it's been a long time coming. Um, it's been a, a passionate project for me and for Liz, um, really since we've since we started at Cal, but really over the past three years of, of um, starting the planning phases and the designs and doing everything necessary to get to the point. Uh, we are starting construction on that project May 1st, um, and then it will be ready for the fall season. Um, we are putting everything up on podium. Um, I don't know if you saw the designs, but we're everything's going to be up on podium. And so it's going to give us the opportunity to have, um, you know, brand new resi pits everywhere um, and, and to completely do a, a redesign. I mean, we're basically going to gut everything out of the facility. Um, clean it, paint it, brand it, you know, make it a, a nice new modern bright space uh, and then have new equipment, the new podium in there. And so um, looking forward to that, you know, getting to the finish line, uh, being able to show showcase that to the world and recruits and and most importantly, have our student athletes training there in the fall. Um, it's it's going to be huge, make a huge positive impact on our program and, and really going to help us um, get one day better. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Justin, for taking the time out of your day to be able to be on this podcast to share about your university and the passion that you have and the passion that you have doing it with the people that you do. Good luck to you the rest of the season. And for everybody else who's tuning in, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Heated Conversations. Remember to subscribe, to share, to like, and leave a comment. I'll see you on the next episode.